Good morning or afternoon, everyone. I am Tony Robinson with MAP, and welcome to today's webinar titled Mastering Hot Runner Balancing, Optimizing Injection Molding Efficiency and Quality, presented by MAP partner RJG. Just a few notes before we get started. I will try to keep all attendees muted throughout the presentation, but please keep yourself muted as well to eliminate any background noise or distractions. We are recording the webinar and it will be up on our webinar archives page in the next few days. You will need a member login to access that page. So just reach out to us if you need any help with that. There is time for questions at the end of the presentation. So please use the chat feature to ask any questions and we'll get to them at the end. And if you have any logistical issues, you can also use the chat uh, and I will help you troubleshoot. So with that being said, I will turn it over to Anthony and Jason. Thank you, Tony. So Thanks, uh, Tony. welcome everybody. Uh, morning, afternoon and evening. I think we've got a few people from all over the place, which is good. So we're just gonna do a short uh, seminar on mastering hot runner balancing. Um, for uh, any of those that don't know me or have never met me, uh, I've got 25 years experience working with RJG as a consultant. And a lot of my activities have been working with customers and suppliers on developing and consulting projects, um, troubleshooting and production and understanding on the contents of that, uh, like how systems, technologies, stuff work. So we're going to run through concepts of how hot runners work, how what influences them, but more importantly, how we can then get effective balance, um, trying to get best performance really from the system itself. As Tony mentioned, um, there's a chat function. So as we go through any questions you guys have got, please post them up there. And what we will do at the end, we've deliberately scheduled this. So there's plenty of time at the end where we can do a Q and A. So any input feedback would, would be greatly appreciated. And then we can cover that when we finish the slides. So to begin, um, hot runner systems, their objective. So ultimately we're trying to provide a molten flow path uh, from the machine nozzle to the cavity. Sometimes that might be a sub runner, but it's just maintaining therefore the melt temperature through the system, from the cylinder, as close to the cavity as we can. That concept means that we just want to maintain melt. If we're trying to melt the plastic in the hot runner system, well, that's actually the function of the screw and the heats that we apply in the injection unit. It's just really extending the flow to the cavities. And we want to do that without creating any unnecessary resistance or volume. So we don't want to prevent flow and also we don't want any unnecessary volume in the system. If we do that, we then prevent any kind of melt temperature changes um, either through shear heat, because we know we actually use the screw to melt plastic through friction and also through residence time. So if we have too great a volume. So very, very simply, we're looking at the hot runner system as an extension of the cylinder, the injection unit, however you want to phrase it, or barrel. Now that's the simple concepts and objectives. What we do have, however, though, are process factors that kind of influence the performance of a system. So there's some common ones we're going to just go through quickly here. Um, quite a few factors we keep re like based around the material itself, um, the actual process, and then some other outside influences. So the key things from a material we need to focus on and think about are viscosity of plastic, its compressibility, the sensitivity to temperature, and also its sensitivity to, to shear. So for many materials, they follow a similar path, but there are some where they can be quite different. We also have to take into consideration the material's thermal conductivity. And then from a more process perspective, we're looking at things like shot size, cycle time, the injection or fill time. Because of the environment the hot runner's housed in, mold cooling is something that can influence its performance and so can colour. So if we break them down a little bit further, what, what ultimately we're trying to do is look at how we can manage resistance and pressure loss. So if you look at the viscosity of a plastic, how will it flows? So is it easy, hard, stiff? What resistance does that generate? So therefore, how do we manage that? 
because any pressure we lose through the hot runner system ultimately takes pressure away from what we've got available to fill the cavity. Equally, we've got the compressibility. So different plastics compress to different degrees. So what, does, what influence does then the volume have on that? Also then as a function of temperature and pressure. So sensitivity to temperature and shear. We've got to make sure that we don't under or overheat material. More importantly, we then also don't create any additional friction. So we don't then don't change flow and, and create temperature change differences going through the system. Links to that is also its thermal conductivity. So is it an insulative or is it a conductive plastic? Is it going to retain heat or is it going to then pass it through quickly? How does that then influence against its sensitivity to temperature and its sensitivity to shear? In terms of shot size, we've got to, we need to make sure that we've got the correct volume of plastic traveling through the system. We want to make sure that there's enough in there to maintain a molten temperature. But again, we don't want too much or too great a volume in the system because with its compressibility, all that adds to is it's an extension of our milk cushion. Regarding cycle time, we need to understand how long the material is going to be present in the system for. So what influence does that have on temperature control? How will that inflect how it flows and the pressure going through the system? Fill time. Well, the quicker we fill, the greater resistance that we create. So therefore, we've got to understand what sort of rates of injection are required based on the volume we've got of the plastic going into the cavities. So again, how much resistance or what fat rate of flow are we going to make sure we need to maintain? And the, the one key one is mold cooling. So the hot runner system is housed within a mold, which itself is cooled. So we've got to understand what that is, specifically quicker, faster cycling stuff, but the temperature which it, the system is working within will have an influence on the temperature of the system itself. And another common consideration is color. So do we need to facilitate color changes, for instance? So are we making it all in one color? Have we got 20? What do we need the system to help facilitate in terms of managing all the things that are above, but also making sure, making it easier potentially for us to manage color changes? So in summary, we have a requirement to manage volumetric fill rate, and that's going to be against the cross-section area of the flow paths. That's how we're going to try and maintain and manage temperature without increasing or changing resistance and also having an influence on volume. So the design itself is trying to manage, well, the influence of both process factors, but ultimately trying to manage how we can minimize pressure loss without having a significant influence on shear rate or residence time. So if we look at the example on the left, if we increase the channel sizes, for instance, in the system, then the shear rate comes down, but the residence time goes up as a consequence. We increase the volume of plastic we can have. The pressure drop can come down as against resistance of flow. We're likely, we're likely to have less temperature rise through shear. However, because the temperature, sorry, the residence time goes up, by volume, we then may see a temperature rise if it's conductive material just by its size. And it works the opposite side. But the narrower we go, then we influence shear rate, we reduce residence time, the pressure drop goes up. And if we go too narrow, we'll increase temperature rise through shear rather than through residence. So when the systems are designed, that's the type of details and content that the suppliers will be looking at. Quite often they'll even do simulations taking in from taking into consideration design materials to make sure we manage that because ultimately we want to maintain an even flow of material to each cavity or drop so with that in mind we need to look at how temperature is actually controlled within the system itself so sure many of you know that we use electric heating elements um, and they're just in, simply in conjunction with thermocouples. So based on the reading from the thermocouple, electric heat, generally PID control, what it is PID control, to then manage temperature. So it's effectively managing a constant temperature where we can throughout the system. But the thing we have to bear in mind though is that the heaters are in contact with metal, not plastic. 
So what we're actually doing is managing the temperature of the steel metal surrounding the material rather than the molten material itself. The thermocouples are also located in the metal. And if we, there's some examples you can see on the picture on the right hand side. So the, the issue that we have is that we're actually managing the outside where it's the inside that we're really focusing on and it's the key thing to consider. Also, when you look at the thermocouples for the tips or the exits to the cavity or runner, we have a sub runner, is that they are located towards the end of the assembly, but they're not at the exit. Obviously, if they're at the exit, they would then create a flow restriction. So depending on the design, the cooling that we have, then there is an influence from the material exit temperature to what it may be a few millimeters down the length of the tip to where the thermocouple is reading and the fact that it's reading still means that there's going to be some form of an offset. Um, the heaters will also have differences in performance. So manifold heaters pull, will, pull, will have a greater resistance and pull more power than those on if for tips. So we've also got to consider that. Um, over age, especially, those heaters will, will decline in performance just, just through general use and wear. So that will manifest itself in, in differences potentially in temperature or response to when we're pulling power based on thermocouple. But the key thing is, we mentioned it on the slide before, is that the systems themselves are actually housed within a mold which is cool. And that temperature is significantly lower than the melt temperature, but it, it, it has to be to cool the plastic. So if we, the more aggressive our cycle times are, then the greater that influence is gonna be from cooling because the, the, the objective is to run the parts as fast as possible so we have a very effective cooled medium, but inside that is our hot runner system. So really, if we think about it in summer, we've got to expect that there's gonna be a difference in the set temperature versus the actual temperature of the system. And that's just considering the fact that where we've got heaters, what they're heating, where we've got thermocouples, what the heaters are responding to, and the fact that the environment that the hot runner system in is, is cooled and maintained at a lower temperature than the melt itself. So the system design itself should mitigate the, like the general process and material factors that we talked about. The problem we have is us being process staff, we can significantly influence how a hot runner performs with the temperatures that we actually set for the operation of it. The assumption often is that the set temperature is what we're actually achieving. Um, the problem we have is if there is a differential, then we could be compromising the design through our own ignorance, if you like. Because also, if we think about it, generally, hot runner systems are set to be on the lower side, nearer on melt, because of the fear of degradation, especially if we're doing process or temperature sensitive materials. It'll always be right, well, let's make sure we need to go as low as we can. But if we've got a set off, we've got an offset between set and actual, by doing that, we actually might be creating quite a significant restriction. And that's really what we've just, we've done. I've been using the method that we're gonna go through for probably, well, it's been over 10 years now. And confidently, the majority of balance issues within multi-cavity hot runner systems is the creation of resistance. And that's by not being able to quantify the difference between set versus actual. The objective of the system, if we remember, is to maintain a molten temperature as it flows and it's balanced through the system. Well, we could compromise its design and its performance just by how we set in terms of temperatures. If we look at an incorrect temperature setting, we're going to create a resistance. That's going to lead material to take the path of least resistance, which then, if we do have any minor differences in heaters and the resistance that they're putting, we're going to get quite significantly unbalanced flow across cavities. So that's all well and good, but how, how can we actually look at trying to understand the systems themselves? Well, from data collection, we can actually see some markers from resistance. Um, when we only change temperature as a parameter, we can use some of these markers to actually identify the influence it's having. 
So if we look at peak injection pressure, for instance, well, that indicates how much resistance is generated as a function of what we're trying to achieve with a volumetric fill rate. That coincides with the material's viscosity. It's a little bit counterintuitive because we know plastics are non-Newtonian and the harder we push, the easier they flow. But the harder we ask a machine to perform, the greater the resistance of the revs on your car, for instance. If the viscosity changes, then it's going to work harder. We're going to generate more pressure. So if we're changing temperatures, <coughs> excuse me, we can use peak injection pressure to give us an understanding of the influence on viscosity. The easy one to look at is also cavity balance. So the actual mass distribution across the cavities themselves. So they're going to indicate resistance just as a function of what gets delivered into what cavities, what gets it first, what gets it last. But the overall difference when we map against temperature gives us an indication of how we're creating or eliminating or minimizing resistance. One of the key factors about materials we mentioned was their compressibility. So we can look at the melt cushion. If we're only changing temperature and we don't and we're not changing volume, any changes in cushion can indicate compressibility of the melt. For some systems we might not see any, but if we've got a large system that has a large volume of plastic that's in there, even just on the injection stage, we may see changes in, in the cushion. But significantly, if we apply all the same practice parameters for hold, so time and pressures with different temperatures, the hot runner system will actually see then how they can influence how much more compressibility or how little we get in the system as it moves through. Shot weight, well, that indicates the combined influence of the above. So resistance, distribution of flow, cavities freezing off before the others, we're getting shorts versus flash, for instance. We're getting greater or less compressibility, that's all gonna have an influence on the shot weight. But there is one parameter we can also use as a control point. So if we, use, we look at our fill time or our injection time, that gives us an indication that if our flow rate is the same, if we have an influence in peak injection pressure, the balance distribution and, and the shot weight, we know that has to be temperature dependent because we're not changing its flow rate. Using those indicators, what we can do is we can actually then see what happens to the molten plastic as a function of temperature. So recording those markers, weighing parts, looking at pressures and time as our control, we can actually see what influence the temperature is having as it flows through that mould with that material as a function of the hot runner system. So quite simply, all we would do is we would just conduct a study running at different temperatures, and this would be for the entire system. And all we would then do is look at those markers because we can use those to see if we can identify when we're starting to achieve some form of optimum flow. So for example, if we're not seeing, if we increase temperature, we would expect to see a decrease in pressure. If that gets to a point where we don't see continually significant decreases, then we're not influencing anymore how it flows through the system. Equally, balance. If we can see a significant change in the distribution of plastic through the cavities, it gets to a point where it doesn't get any different, it doesn't become less or doesn't get more, then we know at that point as well, temperature isn't having an influence. It gives us an understanding of trying to work out what the kind of set versus actual temperature we're achieving is. It's very, very difficult to actually work out what the inside temperature of the system is. So therefore, what we can do is but we can look at these markers to understand if we can see some level of change in performance to give us an understanding of when it's just flowing unrestricted versus when we're actually kind of forcing it through and we're creating a problem. Obviously, the other thing to consider as well is we, all, we need to take into account visual attributes, um, stringing, discoloration, anything like that. So as we're going through these different tests, it's not only the process we're looking at, we do have to understand and look at the parts and interrogate those. So what I'm going to now do is talk through a couple of examples just to show you how that works and what we can do. And these are real life examples. These are, these are tools that we've con conducted this test on in the past. So the first example is um, using a pretty standard form of acrylic, a nylon, uh, sorry, PMMA, 
Um, this is a direct feed hot tip system, just two cavities. Um, pretty standard average, long for some, short for other cycle time, just under a minute. So it's got a melt temperature range between 220 and 260, uh, mold temperature range between 60 and 90. So midpoint was selected um, to achieve melt temperature and mold temperature. And from that, looking at the range of the TDS, we then mapped, now these, these temperatures are in C for those in the US. Um, we just looked at 10 degree difference in temperature, starting at 210 and um, going to 270. What we do at each temperature is we map the peak injection pressure and we record the injection time. We take three shots and from that we work out an average shot weight. We weigh the cavities and then record the lightest and the heaviest cavity. There's only two in this matter, so it's quite easy. And then what we do is we look at the co a comparison of the weights and that then gives us an imbalance. So unsurprisingly, when we're low, we see we actually create quite a significant resistance and cavity two feels a lot a lot further than cavity one. As we increase in temperature, we start to see a decrease in injection pressure. Injection time stays the same because we haven't changed our shot size or change over position. Mass gets slightly bigger, but our distribution starts to improve. And that continues as we go up 10 degrees at a time. But if you look at the graph on the right, you can see that we start to see a leveling off of imbalance and not a significant reduction in pressure. And that's the type of thing that we're trying to indicate and understand. So we understand we can see that shot weight goes up and probably would continue to go up until we start to overpack the cavity. This is fill only as well, by the way. But the injection pressure doesn't then significantly change. And as a function, we can also see that the cavity balance from 240, there's a, there's a little bit of a step change. And then 250 to 260, we get significantly better balance. And then the 270, it starts, it's still good, but it starts to creep higher. So it gives us an understanding that we, even though we've got to melt at 240, Somewhere between 250 and 260, we're actually getting unrestricted flow of material through the system. We're not seeing significant changes in mass. We're not seeing significant changes in pressure. And the balance between the cavities gives us a much better result. So for this example, 255 was used for production. Um, the data was sent to the hot runner supplier. This was a new mold just to make sure that we weren't doing anything that they weren't um, happy with. We were running at 255 versus a an effective melt temperature 245 that was all clarified that was fine and when we actually then apply a pack and hold we end up with 1.7 percent difference by mass between the cavities now this is a amorphous material which isn't particularly compressible um so in this instance even filling it and packing it doesn't significantly change the balance which is why it's quite critical in this example that we made sure that we got it on the flow going to show you another example of where so this is utopia this is ideal world this is this is great change temperatures balance reduces great we can continue this is a larger mold it's a 16 cavity valve gate this time this time we're using a semi-crystalline material and one that's very compressible so we're using a c tool or pom that on the tds has a melt temperature of 190 to 230. So we were obviously, we were trying to achieve 210 and a mold temperature between 60 and 120. This cycle is a much faster cycle time, fairly fast cycling at 9.3 seconds. Same concept was applied. We would go outside, just a little outside of the temperature recommended range on the TDS, TD influence of balance, and see if we can make a decision or discover in what temperatures based so it gave us the most effective flow through the system. The problem we had here, based on the fact that it runs so quickly, is that tips or the system at a 215 degree C, even though we could potentially run the material at, two, at 190, we couldn't, the tips just froze off. 
So went higher and went from 215 to 250 degrees C. Again, as we went up with the temperature, the injection peak injection pressure came down. Injection time varied by 0.01, but if I'm honest, that's probably the three decimal rounding on the machine. Average shot weight increased as we would expect. And we always had one cavity, which was the lightest. And then we had a little bit of a movement around what cavity, which was the heaviest. And we can see our distribution. So up just above when it started to freeze off, we had 22%. From there on in, with the temperature, the balance didn't really change anywhere between, well, in between 14 and 16%. Now, one thing we may, well, we can ask a question, we'll ask the question about at the end. Um, there's a, each company will have its own decisions on what it defines, what balance is acceptable, equally what they're allowed to do with tip temperatures, to understand that. In this case, however, though, 15% on this material would have caused an issue with a critical dimension to do with the, the, the component's length. So that balance had to be improved. So looking at where we saw performances in pressure and oh, there was no real challenge in balance, and also where we didn't see any significant changes in weight, we looked at 245 temperature for the system. From that, the tips were then adjusted. So rather than trying to manage, we wanted to maintain the flow through the system, but then use the tips just to control the flow into the cavities. Because that's often what happens as well, is that you'll see a significant offset from the tip temperatures to manifolds commonly, where people are trying to use the tips to also manage the flow. Manifolds manage the flow, the tips just then control it at the gate for each cavity. So with a 15 degree offset, um, everything was then set for Cavities were the same below the 245 for the manifold. The balance was reduced to 6.4%. This time, when we packed the component at 6.4, it reduced to 2.2 because of the different compressibility of the system, but also the plastic itself. So this is a good example because it doesn't give us the perfect results straight off. But what it does give us is it gives us a functioning operating temperature for the system and then we can use the tips as they're designed just to control and manage the flow between individual cavities to try and see if we can have any improvement. If we can't, then we've got a challenge with the system potentially. And in this instance, we were, made, we were able to reduce the, um, the imbalance and get much better products. So there's two examples. Um, it's about looking at temperature, recording pressure, time, and then mass distribution. And what we're trying to find is at what point we see a benefit or we don't see any greater benefit in changing temperature. So we want to try and promote flow without unnecessarily overheating the material, not creating any issues. But we were working very closely on what the data sheet said from temperature as a starting point. But then in this instance, we, we had the confidence to go higher because if the material itself was able to flow at 190, but the system was freezing off at 2.15, then we had to have had an influence from aggressive cooling. And then we could use that to determine how hot we go. Again, maintaining quality and looking at the components and making sure that there's no issues with temperature. And anyone that's molded POM knows the POM is not good with temperature, certainly not residence time. And these parts had absolutely no issues. Again, this was checked by the hot runner system supplier. We sent the information was sent off but we were able to maintain a much better flow, what is perceived to be a hot temperature on the system, but just because we're trying to overcome the constraints we have from the aggressive cooling to have a sub 10 second cycle time. So to summarize this, because part of the thing that we've said is about managing quality. Um, for any of you that have worked with us in the past, you know that we break the process down into four plastic variables one being heat, uh, one being flow, one being pressure, and final being cooling. Now, the concept is that we work on a, a sequence of events in our molding cycle. 
what we do to the plastic has a significant influence on the next stage. So for instance, unmolten plastic makes it harder to flow. If we don't flow effectively, then the material is freezing off before we can apply even pressure. And if it doesn't pressurize evenly, it's not gonna cool at the same rate. So these differentials, what we're actually trying to overcome, it's a very good way to define injection molding anyway, is in all the part design, material selection, mold design activities, we're always doing our best to try and manage how we flow pressure and cool across a cavity. Because if we can limit the influence they have, then we get a much better part. But more importantly, we start to eliminate some of the stresses that we can develop in plastic. So if we take the assumption that our melt meets our material requirements, so effective melt temperatures within that range, um, and we've got a hot runner system which facilitates the same. If we get a balance and effective flow, we reduce orientative stress. We can get plastic to the further extremities of the cavities easier and quicker. The melt temperature flow front from the entrance to the cavity is more even to the end. That then means we can pressurize against more molten plastic through the cavity, which reduces compressive stress. Also reduce our pressure gradient. So we get a more even balance of plastic going through or pressure through the part. And obviously if we're packing parts better, then we cool them more evenly. So we then start to eliminate tensile stresses. And this is the reason why we look at trying to manage the hot runner temperature so effectively, because if we can maintain the melt that we're trying to do in the injection cylinder, then we've got the best potentials to flow pressurize and cool the plastic and do that evenly. And that's what gives us consistency and repeatability. We're trying to promote all of the part and mold design activities rather than work against them, quite simply. So that's what I wanted to discuss. Um, really now, um, for myself and Jason, it's what questions, thoughts, um, opinions have we provoked with this info? Thank you, Anthony. Uh, the first question that I got was, is profiling the tip temperatures acceptable and to what degree? Right, um, it's a good question. So to answer this, I'm gonna answer it in two ways. As a politician, it's going to be what someone generally within the company that you're probably working with is defined to be an acceptable limit. However, in reality, um, and if you work, work, and I say this working with quite well, many of the hot runner system suppliers, if you're looking at a delta temperature of 20 degrees C, then it would be worth communicating that to the suppliers and getting their understanding and whether they think that's significant. It, it seems to be a common, a common approach that people think plus or minus five degrees C, it seems to be acceptable and is standard. Um, I don't disagree with that, but I would say when you get to 20, so this is C, what's that, Jason and F? I don't know, let me look. <laughs> I don't know, 45, 50, something like that, is it? Yeah, so, something like that, 40, 50, fair enough. If you're getting to that extreme, um, then I would, I would engage with the supplier and see if they think that's a problem. Because it might not just be to do with the flow, it could be to do with the temperatures or tip positions um, and different things like that. That's the question. 68 F. There we go. So I would, yeah, for the alarm bells would start to ring for me if I've got a delta T of 20 C or 68 F. All right. The next question I got, uh, was the temperature the same across all cavities on the hot runner system? To begin with, yes, absolutely. So we have every sprue bush manifold and tip temperature the same to do to, in, to understand and investigate the influence of temperature. And then in the second example, we then try to manage that with different tip temperatures uh, to see if it gave us a better result. But yeah, during the analysis of the flow through the system, we want to maintain the same temperature. So we therefore, in effect, the overall temperature is the influence rather than potential differences across the system. The uh, next one I got is a little bit long. 
is there any scientific method or means to get to know the actual melt temperature inside the hot runner? Is it also limited to measure the purged melt temperature coming out from the hot runner tip? So to answer the first bit, no, because the problem is we could, in theory, put sensing in the systems, but all we're going to do is create a flow restrictor. Also, I'm pretty confident the suppliers aren't going to want holes drilled in with things screwed in because of the issues of pressure, leaking, breakage and, and loss. So, yes, you can. The, the only method really is to then look at purge temperature off the cylinder versus purge temperature through the system. Now, we all know that that's a bit subjective. When you do it 10 times, you might get 10 slightly different results. Um, thermal imaging helps with that, though, as long as it's not clear. Um, but yeah, ultimately, that's the only way we can do it is try and do some sort of manual check to get an understanding. Because in theory, if you've got an offset, which there will be from the time it takes you to put the probe in, if you're doing it in the same manner, what you the offset should be roughly the same from the nozzle as it through the system itself. So it, that's that's more than an acceptable, effective way to do it. Okay. Um, would you go higher or lower than the optimized manifold temperature to balance out the tips? Um, either. This, the example I gave was just one um, where we were trying to promote the flow of one rather than, because we, so in the study itself, in fact, I can go back, there was, there was one cavity which was always the lightest, the heaviest moved a little. Got a little. It was fairly consistent on three, but it was always the lightest with seven. So what we were trying to do is actively see what we could do to promote flow in that rather than trying to go up with temperature. And the only reason for that is because POM is temperature sensitive. Um, but if we didn't have that pattern, we would have tried to go above. We just looked at the data, we looked at the results, and that focused on what we were going to change. But no, get either way. As long as we're maintaining, um, well, sorry, as long as we're looking at part quality and we're not actually physically doing any damage or degrading any of the plastic, then we're just trying to prove at the moment what the difference between set and actuals are. So if you need to go slightly higher, so be it. It might be five degrees, one goes above and one goes five below or vice versa. We're looking at around the 245 is where we're maintaining flow. So in theory, anything slightly above that shouldn't have a significant influence. Okay. This was from a little bit earlier in the presentation, Anthony. Can you elaborate on how temperature can change the volume? Uh, well, volume can change the temperature. That's the way it is. So if we've got a small amount of plastic in there, then we can actually generate frictional heat as we're trying to force it through the channels. So we actually create friction very much like we do moving the screw through the system, or through the plastic. We can do the same thing going through a system. And you start, in some materials, you'll actually see that as like brown. You can actually see streaking or degradation coming through onto the pump. On the opposite side of it, if we've got highly um, insulative plastics, if we have a large volume, we can then get heat through mass, a large mass of it over time. It starts to stagnate and then we get a long residence time. So, yeah, if I said it the other way around, then I apologize, but it's, it's the, it's the volume and how that influences the temperature. One creates heat by friction and one can heat, create heat by residence. Okay. Um, this one is even longer than the other one, Anthony. So I just sent it to you via chat. Um, but for POM material, some suggest to use descending temperature profile from screw through hot runner to hot runner tip. Thus, we are not suggested to typically set higher temperature for hot runner manifold to avoid overheating, burning the melt inside the hot runner. However, your studies show that you raise your temperature inside hot runner manifold to achieve better balance. Could you comment about that? Cool. I mean, that, absolutely, that's the theory, and I absolutely agree. But the reality is we've got an aggressively cooled mold, which is trying to get a very short cycle time. So we have to be realistic in the influence on this example on what temperature is being how it's being managed by the cooling in the system itself so if we went very we couldn't go low on the tips or we wouldn't actually fill any any of the parts if we had chose to go lower end on the tds we probably wouldn't have actually filled the cavities at all so 
the, the concept is correct because we're looking at trying to prevent, well, we, we're trying to manage the formaldehyde in the pond, but also it's very temperature and it is shear sensitive. So we're trying to manage all of those. But equally on the flip side, pond um, hot runner systems generally have very large manifolds. So um, we're actually trying to accumulate some material to get some temperature to help get the flow through the system. That's what the suppliers are trying to do anyway. So it, sometimes one counters the other. But yeah, the lower that we can run, absolutely, but it's relative to how we flow the plastic through the system. So if we've got a mould which isn't running anywhere near as fast and there isn't um, anywhere near the cooling influence on the system, then for the material itself, then the lower in theory, the better. But again, we're looking at it from a flow perspective rather than a relative temperature. Uh, Anthony and Tony, I, I, I have a comment to that. Um, I think one of the biggest things to step back and take a look at is we, we're used to thinking about how the, the heat's generated in the barrel. So we have heat coming from two sources, you know, the outside heater bands, and then the majority of it coming from the screw from the inside out. And it's easy to forget that once it goes into the manifold, um, like you said earlier, it's only coming from the outside in. The heater is around the outside of the manifold and there's nothing, no frictional heat from the inside like a screw. And it's attached to a mold that has cooling channels on it. So that was a big thing for me when I first heard this to get out of, it was a roadblock for me that, uh, that I couldn't set the manifold hotter. But if you logically think about it, that you're resisting a bunch of things to get it to the right town. Yeah, it's a good point. It's just changing the vantage point because, right, and and it's and it's not. This isn't a criticism in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's just generally it, how we've evolved with hot runner systems. Is generally, if you go into a, most factories, they'll be on set on the lower side, just purely simply because on, on that basis, is we're protecting the material. If it stops, we don't want it to overheat. But what we aren't able to visibly see is the offset in temperature. So what we can't qualify is if i set 270 is it giving me 269 or is it giving me 228 now it's in c so apologize for my metrics but that's what we aren't aware of so that's the reason we've changed the focus to flow rather than temperature and it's also to be honest while we would always if we are running hotter than the tds just from a numbers perspective we would then also verify it with the system supplies because they've designed the system. And some of them will design hot half. So they will also have designed the cooling as well. So they would know exactly the influence we're having. And no, none of them, well, I do on every example, so there's probably over a hundred or so that I've actually communicated with the suppliers. They've ever told me what the offset is, but none of them have ever said, no, it's not okay to run the manifold or the temperature slightly hotter than we perceive because it's the real temperature that we're actually trying to manage. All right, uh, I do have one more question. What is the minimum fill only percentage that you would recommend when doing this exercise? Um, there isn't one. Um, we, at preference, I'll try and do about 90% visual fill. Um, the reason for it is I'm then accurately managing closer to the volume that's gotta be injected. So we get an effective, seeing an effective distribution. Um, and we can see enough of a difference. The problem that happens is, is that as soon as we start to compress the cavities, the pressure, the system will balance itself through pressure potentially, if it's a compressible plastic. So it just means that all the values get less. So we get, it's much, it's not as easy to interpret definitive differences. Um, but it's okay doing it if you can't short shot your mold. Um, it's fine. And if you, for instance, if you can't, actually run the mold without a small amount of holding pressure, which is also common, then you, that's where you can use melt cushion because you can also use the melt cushion to understand how the compressibility is changing with a nominal holding pressure. So ultimately for me, it'd be about 90% visual full, just so I haven't got all the parts completely full and they're filling independently of pressure. But if you've got to go fuller, it's fine. It's just, you won't see such significant differences in numbers. It's just harder for it to be so obvious. That's the only that's the only restriction.
All right, and I did just get one more. It's a little bit long as well. If after raising hot runner manifold temperature, we still cannot achieve the desired flow balance, we then continue to adjust hot runner tip temperature for this up to what hot runner tip temperature difference, minimum and maximum, that you think we are allowed to set 10 degree or even higher? Well, this instance, the one that's on the screen at the moment was 15. Um, and that was purely because of one cavity. Um, I would look at I would look at having a manifold set and I would go 10 degrees either side of that. If I can't do that, then I would have a look more. But this is where on a lot of controllers now, you can look at the heater performance, for instance. So if you've got a problem, we, we didn't put it in this study. We do do this in our own facility because we have the controllers that do it. But I'm aware that not all can. So on some controllers, you can actually see heater performance or resistance and also power being consumed. And if you can get the graph up, you can see how it's doing it over time. That will give you a really good indicator whether you even temperature is even going to do it, for instance. So if you're getting within 15, 20 degrees C, so it, well, it goes back to the 20 degrees C. If I've got a delta temperature of 20, then and there's one cavity, for instance, which is always a problem, or the problem is just mo there's never the same cavity showing the same pattern, then there's something else that I can't influence with tech. Well, it is a temperature influence, but it's something that I'm not going to be able to manage. So that, that's where, as far as I would go, a delta of 20 C, so 68 degrees F. And for the numbers, I try and understand that there's obviously some other issue that's creating the problem. All right. I am not seeing any other questions come in. So Anthony and Jason, thank you both very much. And obviously all of our JG for being a great MAP partner. Uh, thank you to all attendees uh, for being here as well. Just a reminder, the webinar recording will be posted uh, by the end of the week. Um, so check that out once it's up there. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone again. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank, thank you, everyone. Have a good day.